and Iceland's ambassador to Canada, who will join us. Uh, he's on the call as well, Thinar, and he will be uh, doing the concluding remarks. Um, so Thinar and I are in regular contact about how to how to elevate the um, the relationship, how to bring profile to the work that we're doing, and um, I'm glad that we both have a very common vision. So I'm pleased to invite all of you to the first of a, a number of webinars that will be taking place over the course of 2022. Um, we're not quite at 2022 yet, but we are starting our celebrations of the 75th anniversary of our diplomatic relations through this webinar series. And part of the idea behind today's webinar is to share uh, to listen to some of the work that's currently underway in terms of research in both Canada and Iceland, and also to carve out a little bit of a, a path forward and to get input from those of you on the call today about areas where you would be interested in, in having future discussions throughout 2022. Um, I know that not all of you, although maybe all of you can see who's on the call, but certainly we've seen the list of those who confirmed and I'm thrilled that uh, there are so many familiar faces and names on the list. So welcome to those of you that I know and hello to those of you that I don't know. Um, I'm pleased that we have a number of representatives from um, universities, colleges, research networks across Canada and Iceland. We have a number of government officials from both governments. We have representatives from business, from academia and from the arts. Um, and all those interested in Canada-Iceland relations. So I think this is really great. I'm thrilled that so many of you have dialed in. Um, at the end of our call, we'll learn a little bit more um, from Leonor about uh, the, the, the way forward and some of the other activities that we will be doing. Um, but today, we will be diving into a discussion on existing and future research collaboration um, with a view to landing on future topics. This is a collaboration between the two embassies, as I've mentioned, as well as Polar Knowledge Canada and the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network. Now, before I do introductions of our two speakers, I want to uh, highlight, I have a copy of it here, not all of you have it. This is a letter of agreement, otherwise known as a memorandum of understanding between Polar Knowledge Canada and the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network. Um, I'm not going to read it all to you, but I rather I'm going to just highlight four areas of what this memorandum is all about. And it was signed in Akureyri, Iceland in June of 2016, um, with a view to really uh, advancing and strengthening the research collaboration on Arctic issues between our two countries. So some of the excerpts from this MOU that I pulled out to highlight for you today are that it's about sharing new knowledge and encouraging and coordinating research, encouraging shared access to infrastructure. This could be in the form of research facilities, for example, developing a framework for collaboration to strengthen activities in areas of common interest, encouraging the application of results, uh, encouraging participation of academic institutions, Northern-based organizations, Northern -based organizations, agencies of government and the private sector. And then finally, identifying opportunities for the exchange and training of scientific and technical personnel and students. On that last point, I know there are a number of students on our call today, and I'm thrilled with that. And one point I'd like to reflect upon in the discussion segment is how to encourage the participation of more students. So we'll come back to that. So give some of that, give that some thought while you're listening to our speakers. Um, I will introduce um, our two speakers now. I'll um, start by introducing Embla. Embla, I'm going to start with you because I think you're speaking first. Is that, is that correct? I know we decided this and I'm just having a moment. Yes, you're that's there. Correct. Yes, you are. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'll start by introducing Embla, and then we'll have Embla speak, and then we'll uh, turn to David Hicks. So Embla Odstotir is um, the director of the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network and the Polar Law Institute in Akureyri, Iceland. Um, she represents Iceland on a number of fora, boards, and committees. It's a long list of them, but I'm going to include a few here. The Arctic Council, including specifically the Sustainable Development Working Group, the European Polar Board, the International Arctic Social, Arctic Social Science Association, the Arctic Science Ministerial Science Advisory Board for the most recent Arctic Science Ministerial, and chair of the Icelandic Joint Committee of Arctic Affairs. So her, she has an extensive background in a number of areas. Her research and education has been interdisciplinary and includes um, anthropology, 
socioeconomic development, cultural geography, international relations, international law, and indigenous studies. Um, she is the project lead of the Gender Equality in the Arctic Project, which is an Arctic Council Icelandic chairmanship project um, that she will touch upon in her remarks. So, Embla, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you, Jeanette. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today to discuss topics of shared interest and potential avenues for collaboration. I look forward to working with you guys on revitalizing the MOU. A lot has happened since it was signed in 2016. Back then, the network was in its early days of existence and pretty much a one-person show. It has developed considerably since then and today is more established with a wide network of members and collaborators and a pretty heavy project load, not least the 19 to 2021 Icelandic chairmanship of the Arctic Council, where we work closely with the chairmanship team. This included representing Iceland economic and cultural expert group, uh, which falls under the Arctic Council Sustainable Development Working Group. We led the chairmanship project Gender Equality in the Arctic and more. During this time, we also represented Iceland in the Science Advisory Board of the Arctic Science Ministerial 3, which was co-organized by Iceland and Japan. We will our collaboration with the Ministry for Education, Science and Culture, and not least the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, including through continuing leading the gender project and also in organizing and managing an engagement process relating to Iceland's newly updated policy in the Arctic. There's considerable collaboration take place between Iceland and Canada. Some we know of, others we do not. We will not be providing a comprehensive list of cooperation and projects today, although it would be great someone were to compile and map out both past and existing cooperation between Iceland and Canada. Perhaps there's a master's student somewhere out there that would find that interesting. I just want to highlight a couple of things that are current and quite prominent in my mind. And I want to start by trying to share with you a link to a web page so I don't have to go into too much detail for this project. Uh, let's see if I can make this work in the chat. Please, everyone, let me know if this doesn't, doesn't work properly. The first one I do want to highlight is the Gender Equality in the Arctic project. Um, this is a project that's been ongoing since 2013. It is an Arctic Council Sustainable Working Group project and was a chairmanship project during Iceland's chairmanship in 2019 to 2021, culminating in a report published in May 2021 in Tan Arctic Council Ministerial Meeting. The report was welcomed during the ministerial and included in the Reykjavik Declaration 2021. In addition to the topic of gender being included in the first Arctic Council strategic plan. The project is led by Iceland and co-leads include Finland, Norway, the US, the Sami Council and the Aleut International Association and of course Canada. Canada has, from the project's inception, been a very, very active contributor in the project, and our collaboration has been nothing short of excellent. Canada's contributions and support during the development of the report was instrumental in pulling the report together in time for the ministerial and for the project's overall success. Now, in phase four of the project, Canada has indicated its continued support and I will look forward to working together on implementing the recommendations provided in the report. Another initiative that I want to uh, discuss today is uh, a series of webinars and I'm sharing another link. I hope that works. If it doesn't, let me know. Um, this is a webinar series we're working on with a Canadian-based Women in Renewable Energy or WIRE. It's a series of four online webinars focusing on renewable energy sustainability and inclusiveness. The first webinar will be on November 24th, focusing on renewable energy in remote areas and opportunities for clean energy in the Arctic. The other webinars will focus on women and the energy transition in the Arctic, Arctic energy policy, and a full-scale renewable energy Arctic grid. These will take place in January, February, and March, respectively. 
<clears throat> and to find further information and register for the events, you can talk, go to the Share Your North webinar platform. Um, I shared the link in the chat. If it doesn't work, let me know, and I will I will try to do better. Co-organizers of these webinars are the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Iceland, the Embassy of Iceland to Embassy of Canada to Iceland, the Directorate of Equality in Iceland, Electricity Human Resources Canada, and the Northeast Development Agency in Iceland. Another interesting avenue to further pursue is the collaboration that has already taken place between the Canadian High Arctic Research Station in Cambridge Bay and the RIF Research Station in the Northeast. This collaboration took place under the auspices of the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program led by the Arctic Council Working Group, CAF. And we hope to be able to strengthen these ties to continue our cooperation. As both of these stations, in addition to Sachsenberg in Greenland, have been identified by CAF, primary locations for establishing baselines and monitoring changes due to climate change, uh, due to climate and environmental change, it will make sense to engage in further knowledge sharing and exchange of researchers and students. Particularly on the Icelandic scale, we could learn a thing or two from our colleagues in Canada. Last but not least is the webinar series of which this one is the first in celebration of the 75 year anniversary of diplomatic relations between the two countries. As I can see, we have much to discuss and jointly work on. Some topics behind are northern agriculture and food security, resource management in general, but not least in terms of fisheries management. I believe we have shared issues relating to rural development, such as in challenges for education, economic diversification, healthcare, connectivity, and infrastructure in general. Then, of course, we have shared interests relating to the natural sciences and ecosystem health, but David will likely discuss that to a greater extent. As part of our discussion today, I believe, is to call for ideas and topics of shared interest, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing those and being a part of this dialogue. One aspect of our collaboration we will have to explore is one of joint funding of projects, but I believe I address this, so I will not go further down that road. Uh, so that we have to listen to suggestions and ideas from our, from our audiences, I will, I will cut it Jennifer, uh, Jean Jeanette, are you out there? Yes, thank you so much. Emma. Excellent, thank you so much for your remarks and for the links that you provided in the chat. Thank you, Frederick, Frederica, for um, uh, adding a bit more of those links that were missing. So that's really helpful. Um, your points are really uh, certainly relevant and um, I really look forward to hearing kind of where there's complementary complementarity to what uh, David Hick plans to touch upon, as well as within the conversation section at the end. And I appreciate that you also brought up students and how to increase student mobility. Uh, so over to David Hick, um, a few words about David. David was actually in Iceland and involved in some of the research here at the time that this MOU was, um, was signed back in 2016. So I was, and I know Embla also, we were quite pleased when we saw that uh, in September, David Hick moved to Cambridge Bay to take on the role of chief scientist at Polar Knowledge Canada. Um, he moved to Cambridge Bay, which is in Nunavut, and he's the executive director of programs at, at Polar Knowledge Canada, which we say, we call it POLAR. So I hope I don't start using that acronym. I'm trying to not use acronyms. David is also a professor of ecology at Simon Fraser University. Previously, he was at University of Alberta and Toronto. He's adjunct professor at the Agriculture Institute of Iceland. Over the past 38 years, his research has focused on the dynamics of cold region environments, interactions between plants and herbivores, impacts of rapid climate change, and the determinants of social ecological resilience. His work has been conducted in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, Hudson Bay, Iceland, Svalbard, Australia, sorry, Svalbard is not in Australia, Svalbard, comma, Australia, and the mountains in Western Canada and Costa Rica. He also has served on a number of boards and continues to serve on many boards like EMBLA, um, including executive director of the Canadian International Polar Year Secretariat, 
president of the International Arctic Science Committee, vice chair of the Arctic Council-led Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks Initiative, and as advisor to many Arctic research organizations. Finally, I'll flag that he is a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society and recipient of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society Bergman Medal and Polar Medal. David, are you there? And is the connection working? I think you're in Ottawa right now. Thank you, Jeanette. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Um, and uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, and just show a few slides, I think, just a few photographs of, of examples of some collaboration. But I, I have to, um, I want to welcome everyone to this webinar. I was very, very pleased when, um, when the suggestion for this, uh, both this uh, celebration of the 75 years of of diplomatic relationships and 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 the opportunity to talk about what we've accomplished uh, with um, in terms of collaboration over the last few years and and um, Embla, you've been uh, you've been a, a great um, partner in 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 implementing the the early ideas that we had about um, about cooperation with and and a, and an MOU that might make some of that easier for us to accomplish uh, together. So uh, here's a, if everyone can see my screen, here's a, here's a photograph I thought I would show of, of that um, auspicious day on June 11th in 2016, when, uh, when the uh, uh, letter was signed. Uh, and really what this was meant as a, as a very enabling mechanism for us to just promote additional cooperation between, between Canada and Iceland. Um, and to support um, anyone that wanted to uh, begin or continue or, or expand on, on collaborative activities. So it really was not directed at any particular project, but more as a mechanism for us to promote collaboration. And as Embla indicated, those were early days for the Icelandic Arctic um, uh, Research Network, Cooperation Network. And these were also very early days for, for uh, Polar Knowledge Canada as well. Uh, Polar Knowledge had, had just been created a year before as a, as a new agency of the Government of Canada to provide a, a point of contact and, 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 and really position a, a strong leadership in terms of Arctic science, polar science, and, and technology. And to do that in collaboration and cooperation with, uh, with Northern communities, Indigenous organizations, the Northern governments, with the academic community, uh, to make it easier for government of Canada to deliver on uh, research and programs in, in, in the Canadian North and, and to help to coordinate international collaboration and cooperation. And it's really in that context that, that this was one of the first uh, letters of agreement that, that Polar undertook uh, to engage with uh, Iceland in, in looking at the possibilities for collaboration. At that time, the new Canadian High Arctic Research Station uh, in Cambridge Bay in Nunavut. This is the this is the view from my my new front yard in, in Cambridge Bay. Uh, it was still uh, under construction. It was a it was still a, a bit of a hole in the ground, but it's it's um, fully ready and operational now. And uh, we're looking forward to to uh, welcoming researchers from uh, across the country and around the world um, in the coming year as we all sort of start to try to reopen from, from uh, the, the pandemic that uh, has uh, made things much more difficult recently. Um, and just a few photographs for those of you who, who haven't uh, seen the, the, the facilities uh, at CHARS, as we call it, the Canadian High Arctic Research Station. We have about 8,000 square meters of research space, both for uh, supporting field operations, uh, community spaces, meeting spaces, and uh, specialized laboratories, and 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 we have housing uh, available for researchers, visiting researchers on the campus as well. So, uh, if you look at the at, at the Polar Knowledge Canada website, you can see much more information about the facilities there, and and also sort of take a walk through a virtual walk through of of the laboratories. And in terms of our, our science and technology program, I'm not going to go into any great details, but we, we operate within um, a very large region. The, 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 this red uh, triangle here is, is Cambridge Bay on the uh, southeastern uh, shoreline of, of Victoria Island in, in, in the Canadian archipelago. And our, in, in, 
ecological monitoring area, our environmental monitoring area includes uh, what we call the Katitniat region of the central Canadian Arctic, uh, which, which spans four different bioclimatic zones um, from, uh, from, from the, the mainland in, into the high Arctic islands. And we're doing a lot of work to uh, understand biodiversity, ecosystem function, uh, and effects of climate change within this region. Uh, another area of priority, and much of this work is done in collaboration with uh, uh, Inuit and, and Indigenous organizations and communities within, uh, with, across Northern Canada, is to understand uh, how uh, community uh, wellness and ecosystem health are related, sort of a one health approach where we, we look at wildlife health, contaminants, food security, and things like that, with a real focus on, on, on country foods, um, uh, caribou, musk ox, char, things like that. And the third area is really around uh, renewable energy and infrastructure. Um, we have projects where we're looking at uh, wind and, and solar as opportunities for um, replacing diesel uh, generation in northern communities. We have a new project we've just started with the uh, National Research, of Ca uh, Research Council of Canada on biofuels, uh, looking at food waste, uh, uh, redirecting food waste in northern communities. And, uh, and, and just last week, a number of, of uh, experiments were conducted uh, in collaboration with, with high school students in Cambridge Bay, looking at different types of food waste and the sort of uh, anaerobic activity that they, uh, that, uh, that, that can generate. Um, and a great interest in geothermal research. And I think this is an opportunity for uh, expanding collaboration uh, in, this, in this type of work with, with Icelandic colleagues. So I just wanted to give a few examples of research collaboration. As, as Embla said, this isn't meant to be exhaustive, but just some ideas about um, the type of collaborations that are possible. Most of these are, are fairly organic. They're initiated by uh, researchers or, or by students that are, are seeking opportunities to conduct uh, research um, in different parts of the North on different topics. And uh, hopefully the, the uh, uh, cooperation agreement allows us to uh, help support that work uh, more effectively and perhaps to, to uh, advance it more quickly. So just a couple of ideas. Um, we, we did, as Emily indicate, uh, have a, have, we piloted a student exchange project back in 2018, and I think we would have continued this um, if, if uh, it hadn't been for COVID. But um, we offered a student um, based at an Icelandic university and at a Canadian university an opportunity to, to uh, conduct research in, in the other country uh, based on their, on their particular requirements and interests. I think it was quite successful and it's the sort of thing we could look at uh, uh, expanding and, and formalizing with, with additional uh, partners, um, particularly universities in, in, both, in both Iceland and in Canada. Um, and, and the other thing, and, and Ambla mentioned this, of course, is, is that um, we have a number of research stations, research centers, and these are really platforms for collaboration. Um, and uh, these green dots here on the map are the, are the, the uh, stations that are participating in the Interact Forum. Uh, and, and there's a number of mechanisms that Interact has for, for facilitating exchange of, of students and researchers and, and uh, 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 common uh, uh, collection of, of data so that we can compare sites across the Arctic region or sharing of data and expertise. Um, and, and so I think that looking at the research stations in, in both Canada and Iceland as, as locations where collaborative work could be expanded in the future is, is really an opportunity. For example, just something as simple as uh, I have a I have a uh, a met station sitting uh, uh, above the uh, Karloff uh, station in in uh, in North Iceland. Um, the other network we could look at, and and this again is is a recent development, is look at the University of the Arctic and the thematic networks within the University of the Arctic as ways of connecting researchers, uh, students, and, and possibilities for funding and other sorts of institutional and, uh, support. And, and one of the recent examples where there's collaboration between Canadian and, 
and Icelandic uh, researchers and students and institutions is, is a, the Herbivory Network, um, which has been operating for a number of years. But uh, now that it's within the UArctic thematic network programs, it, it again creates more opportunities for, for collaboration. And just one example of, of some recent um, uh, work that's been funded by RANUS, by the, the Icelandic research um, funding organizations and supported uh, through, through Canadian partners, where we've been able to have students working uh, in Iceland, looking at the effects of, of grazing, particularly sheep grazing and uh, environmental variability and climate in Icelandic highlands where uh, land degradation and restoration are, are, are significant issues, but with lots of parallels to the situation in Northern Canada as well. And, uh, and this has even allowed us to sort of branch into uh, to, uh, education opportunities. For example, uh, uh, this project, uh, uh, the cooperation around, around grazing and, and land restoration led to uh, uh, an environmental, uh, a MOOC, a massive open online course called Sheep in the Land of Fire and Ice, which has become quite popular. Again, a collaboration with some Canadian um, uh, institutions of both video production, Simon Fraser University, and a large number of, of partners in, in Iceland. The same is true if we look at geothermal energy. Uh, for several years now, there's been, um, uh, since at least 2015, um, when there was a symposium at the Arctic Circle Forum to define northern energy solutions, there's been a partnership between um, primarily Quebec-based um, uh, universities and research organizations and University of Iceland, Reykjavik University, Landsvirk, and um, looking at different ways of, of using uh, geothermal energy as heating, as an alternative uh, heating source um, and some innovative work on, say, using um, uh, flooded abandoned mines in uh, in central Quebec as a source of of low temperature ge geothermal heat for uh, for remote communities. So, so a number of possibilities, I think, to 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 look at uh, uh, collaboration in, in that area. There's lots of work going on in uh, glaciers and ice dynamics, particularly related to related to climate change change. Um, I think there's a, a number of people um, that have been involved in this work on, on the call uh, today. Um, and, and there's also work that's, that started again about 2015 on uh, collaboration between uh, Philippe Archambault at uh, Laval University and um, Steiner Mothelsdotter at, at the Marine uh, and Freshwater Research Institute in, in Iceland, looking at benthic uh, diversity uh, generally, the taxonomy and and uh, uh, species diversity in, in the marine environment. And more recently, I think related to fish farming, both in the West and East Fjords and in Iceland and, and how that influences the uh, marine environment on uh, sedimentation rates and things like that, nutrient cycling on the, on the seafloor. And most recently, uh, uh, I think there's possibility, or more recently, people have identified possibilities to work on kelp and, and seaweed diversity in the Arctic. We've had some visitors from the Canadian Muse Museum of Nature in Cambridge Bay in the last couple of weeks that, that uh, could pick up some work and, and again an area for collaboration, cooperation. And then finally we sort of you know thinking of, of new big projects we might be able to undertake. Uh, University of Akre and, and um, the Marine Institute and the Polar, um, uh, uh, a few other organizations um, have been involved in discussions over the last couple of years of, of potentially establishing a marine observatory in Eyjafjord in, in, in outside of Akureyri in, in northern Iceland. Um, th this is over on the side is a is a, 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 a subsurface platform that's attached to a cable that was installed in in Cambridge Bay uh, off the wharf for a number of years. A community was involved in in uh, building and, and maintaining it. Uh, provided information about the pretty unique um, species that are on the seafloor just, just off the community. And there's possibilities for an instrumented uh, cable and, and uh, subsurface observatories linked to a marine uh, ecosystem project in, in a fjord as well. So a little cartoon and, and again, bringing an ocean that where Canada and, and other organizations that have experienced doing this in in, in the Canadian Arctic might be a way to, to think about collaboration as well. So I just wanna go 
conclude by, by uh, putting up this uh, photograph of the um, signing of that uh, agreement back in 2016. Uh, it was meant to be a, a catalyst for future collaboration and cooperation. And, and really our purpose of the seminars, um, this first seminar and, and the seminars over the, 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 the coming year is to create a forum and an opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into what some of those collaborative opportunities might look like. And then to put in place the pieces that are required uh, to uh, support um, research and, and mobility and, and an exchange of ideas uh, going into the future. And, and uh, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Jeanette, for, uh, to moderate a discussion. And, and we hope everyone can, can pitch in with some few ideas uh, things we can do. Thank you. Is it it's six o'clock already? Okay, so I think if I can ask everyone to put their phone on mute if you're not, uh, if you're not me for the moment. <laughs> um, what I might ask, thank you, David, for that uh, very comprehensive overview and uh, both updates on Polar Knowledge Canada, as well as some areas where you think we can dive deeper and expand. Specifically, I liked the, com the point about this, the, the pilot of the student exchange and where might we be able to do that, um, even with other, including other universities in Canada and in Iceland, and then some uh, utilizing thematic networks of the Arctic. Um, I, uh, I have been uh, listening and also enjoying the, the chat where we're getting uh, some information on where people are from. So what I might start as we're diving into this, that's we finished the formal part. So here's the more informal part. Before we dive in and uh, before I turn to others for some comments or input, I just want to ask if everyone can go in the chat if you want to and just say where you are. You can, you can I think we see your name. So uh, if you share with us where, where you are right now, that'll give everyone an idea of um, who we have on the call today. Um, there we go, we've got Nigeria, well, St. John's, Ottawa, Vancouver, Rankin Inlet, Athens, great, Gatineau, Halifax, Svalbard, Reykjavik, I know we have, uh, we have Gimli as well. I saw that earlier, which is great. We have Newfoundland. That's gone too fast. I couldn't say it fast enough. Uh, wonderful. Happy Valley Goose Bay. That must be smart ice friends there. And Mark and Tromso. Fantastic. This is fantastic. Okay, so now I'm gonna ask another chat question. Is um, This is very broad, but uh, and not all of you are researchers or scientists, but I'm gonna ask the broad question what are your research interests? And you can say whether it's something you're working on or something you're specifically interested in that you think might be relevant to this conversation. And again, this is optional. You don't have to put in anything, but if you wanna share what your research interests, tourism, cryosphere, biodiversity, science, diplomacy, governance, polar ice, Arctic security, cryosphere, climate, marine conservation, if you want tourism, yeah, mainstreaming of all this wonderful work, biological anthropology, biodiversity, data governance and analytics. Governance, that's great, this is really helpful. Thank you everyone, energy and waste, waste management, indigenous issues, international Arctic matters. Okay, fantastic, this is great. Well, thank you for all of those bits of input. Um, where I want to start is uh, I, I want to open this up and I think what I'm going to ask people to do is if you have something you want to say, put your hand up in the chat and I hope I can see the chat. I've got a few screens up so I should be able to watch and if not, I'll ask one of my colleagues on the phone to help me. Um, I know that I, I was speaking with a, a, a colleague over at Memorial University who I know that Memorial has done some interesting work working with uh, Icelandic universities here. So. I'm gonna ask if Neil is on the line and if Neil wants to say a few things about some of the work going on at Memorial to, to, as others think through some of their comments or questions that they want to weigh in. David, did you wanna say anything else or you're just listening? Okay. No, you're fine. Okay, good, okay. Neil, are you, are you on the line?
Okay, maybe Neil's not hearing me possibly. Okay, so can I maybe, let's see, he is not. Okay, um, I did, I thought I saw him here, but that's fine. All right, so I, therefore I'm going to ask, and I'm not seeing where the hands go up here, but maybe someone can help me. Uh, if there is someone who would like to dive in as a first comment or question in response to those fantastic overviews of some of the existing research currently underway. And one thing that I, I want to echo what David was saying, David Hick, is that, um, you know, even though this memorandum was signed between Polar Knowledge Canada and the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network, it by no means that this collaboration is limited to those two entities. And so I think what we're really trying to do is to uh, use that as a bit of a mechanism, but then try to elevate that and actually loop in, link in with some of the other initiatives and activities that are either underway at other universities or organizations in Canada and Iceland, um, either ones that are underway or new ones, and, and possibly even just adding on players. Um, Neil, I see you've joined the call now, and I just wondered if you wanted to say a few words about the work going on over at Memorial to start stimulating the conversation a bit. Yes, thanks, Jeanette. Uh, uh, I've been here. I just had some connection issues and unmuting issues just then. No uh, problem uh, at all. We were happy to wait for you. I'm glad you're there. I'm glad this is working. <laughs> yeah, so so uh, briefly, uh, because I know we haven't got much time, the, the uh, memorial has uh, a very strong set of research in uh, the oceans area and also in, in coastal communities, both um, across Newfoundland and north into Labrador, and now more uh, recently with a, a memorandum of un understanding that we signed with Nunavut Arctic College. So uh, we have also put in place a research impacting Indigenous groups policy, which is to improve the way in which we do research with and for um, and in collaboration with um, Indigenous groups and communities. Uh, so, and that's uh, uh, in place and uh, we're working through the way in which it works in practice. In terms of some of the highlights of things we do, I noticed the um, uh, David's talk with, with the uh, Ocean Observatory. We, we do a lot of that type of work and we also have um, work that involves gliders and autonomous underwater vehicles. Uh, both in cold waters, but also iced waters. Uh, we're obviously uh, committed to research in the north, and we're part of um, the Ocean Frontier Institute, uh, which is a partnership between ourselves and Dalhousie University and the University of Prince Edward Island. And lastly, I see Carolyn Harding is on the call. Uh, the uh, Smart Ice um, uh, network and project and social enterprise was uh, formed out of uh, Trevor Bell's research group that was at Memorial, Memorial University here. Uh, and so that's a very brief update. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. That helps to complement uh, some of the other comments previously made. Um, we do have one hand up, which is Rob Hubert, which I'm going to go to in a second. Before I do that, I want to ask a question of the audience for you to think about while, uh, while Rob is making his point. One of the questions I have is um, about where are the opportunities? So this is partly, you know, are there were within researchers, research organizations and networks, but what are the opportunities to, off, to, to share that, that knowledge, um, whether it's platforms, whether it's webinars, whether it's public events, et cetera, that kind of thing. So if I can ask people to think a little bit about um, not only the what, but the how, how we communicate and how we diffuse some of those, that, that information. So if I can maybe turn to, to Rob and Ma Rob, for the sake of others, if you can introduce yourself to others before you uh, make your point, that would be great. Okay. 
My name is uh, Rob Hubert. I'm with the Department of Political Science at the University of Calgary, and it was actually my pleasure to work with uh, both Jeanette and David Hicks on the uh, board for, um, uh, well, at the time, Polar Commission. So um, I'm finding all these discussions quite fascinating and interesting. My question, Jeanette and David, is first and foremost, I think I know the answer to the first question, and that is um, whether or not social science can, uh, can take advantage of this network. I mean, all the examples that have been given so far are on the scientific side. Um, I haven't heard anybody say specifically that the social sciences can't be included on this or the uh, agreement, uh, the 2016 agreement. So I guess the first question is whether or not we are can 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 become engaged. And if that's if the answer is yes, then I have a second follow up question. Okay, I think I can say for all of us that the answer is yes. If there's any strong oppositions, then I'll turn to my colleagues to jump in, but I, yeah, yes. Okay, good. Caroline says yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. Okay, so my next question then, you know, thinking in terms of the opportunity that you presented, and I mean, from the social science side, when we talk about Icelandic Canada security issues, we think stuff of the GIUK gap, uh, the Chinese Icelandic aerospace defense agreement, all sorts of neat stuff that hasn't been examined. How can you help facilitate that type of a re research? In other words, I, I get it in terms of providing facilities, in terms of doing shared research. I get the part in terms of the shared students. But if we want to start looking in terms of, um, of engagement with those Icelandic scholars that are interested in that issue, is there an avenue? And then once that, that is in fact um, created, what else can you provide in that context? Thank you for that question, Rob. And Blade, can I turn to you to take a crack at that, an answer to that? Sure, I'll try to answer that question. I first wanna just uh, um, address the, the first question Rob had. Um, I, think, I think social sciences are, are very part of, of the research that's taking place in, in the Arctic. And I think that there is a continued need of social sciences. Uh, I think we all know that natural science does tend to attract more attention and funding. So if we can together figure out a way to elevate the social sciences within this agreement, that would be a very welcome endeavor indeed. Um, in terms of uh, connecting with scholars for specific social science subjects, I think the best avenue for us to, to look at is to approach the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network as we have 30 uh, domestic members within our auspices and can provide connections to scholars uh, of similar shared interests. If that answers the question, I think that's the simple answer to the question. Excellent. Thank you, Ambla. I'm going to turn to Peter Askersson, former Icelandic ambassador to Canada and now Iceland's senior Arctic official, for his comment or his question. Uh, thank you, Janet. I, I don't know if you can see me, uh, but hopefully you can hear me. Oh, here it goes. Start my video. Right. So uh, good evening, everyone. I, I just wanted to make a comment just, just to thank you, uh, the organizers, the two embassies for uh, organizing the, this webinar and, and not, not only that, but a series of webinar and and also thank uh, Embla and David for their uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentations. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, we have Jeff Sarella. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, from the Canadian Museum of Nature. Over to you, Jeff. Close enough. Thanks, Jeanette. Yeah, I'm the Vice President of Research and Collections here at the Canadian Museum of Nature, and I just wanted to share very briefly, uh, the, we've got research projects going on focused on the biodiversity of vascular plants, of lichens, of seaweeds, of diatoms, and other microalgal groups, and some other branches of the tree of life, and also programs on small mammal ecology, and studies of the animals that lived in the Arctic millions of years ago when uh, the temperature was quite a lot higher. And as occurs to me that there, there may well be opportunities for some of our researchers to collaborate with researchers in, in Iceland. I've collaborated with uh, Icelandic researchers fairly recently. I suspect others at the museum have, but there could be future opportunities to advance those relationships. 
A second part is as a natural history museum, we house a collection of, of objects that support research and also document biodiversity and geodiversity over time and space. So we definitely have collections that originate from Iceland of plants and animals and mm -hmm. other creatures. Um, I can't say how many because uh, only 25% of our museum collection is data-based, um, which is the case for most museums. But just for fun, I did a quick search on the Global Biodiversity Information Facility to see how many specimens from Iceland have currently been mobilized, their data, um, that are housed in Canadian institutions. And it's about 750. And almost certainly that's a gross underrepresentation of the actual number of specimens in museums that document Icelandic biodiversity. Um, but the data just haven't been mobilized. You ask the question, you know, how can we share information? Well, for this kind of information, museum specimen collection data that really provide baseline information about the past and the present, um, we've got tools to mobilize it, GBIF, um, and used by the international community. Our challenge is how do we get the data from analog format into the database so it can be shared, discovered, and then used. So there may be opportunities uh, in that area to get some of that work moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so we have no hands up at the moment. So I'm just going to maybe ask um, a question for either our, our speakers or for our participants. Um, topics for future webinars. Let's go with that one. Sort of two burning questions that I have. That's one of them. I want to come back to what Rob talked about social sciences. I think your, your speakers and your organizers are all very much in agreement about the need to include social sciences in this con in this conversation on research, absolutely, in research and science. Um, I know as a fact that all of us are interested in indigenous knowledge and how that uh, needs to be front and center of uh, Northern science research in Canada. Um, I have found, of course, I'm relatively new in Iceland and I have spent a lot of time working on Arctic issues and when I, talk to Icelanders about Canada's north, I'm always really impressed that they, Icelanders, generally speaking, they, they know a lot about Canada's north, and they also are very interested in learning more about Indigenous issues. And um, so I, I'm, I'm, I, I personally am wanting to do a lot of things next year that help to profile and raise awareness and um, increase our knowledge on Indigenous issues in Canada and share that globally. So I'd say indigenous knowledge and science is certainly something that we may consider in the context of a webinar. Um, if there are people in the group here that want to talk about specific topics that you'd love to hear and learn more about or that you might want to speak about at a future webinar. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about food waste. I think innovation in, in food security could be really fascinating too, knowing some of the really interesting work that's going on uh, in the two countries. Um, so I'd like to ask that question about topics. Topics, anyone on topics? Oh, there's a hand up. Neil, go ahead. Um, thanks, Jeanette. Um, I wanted to comment on the, um, uh, the, the uh, social science aspect because they, uh, well, first of all, um, uh, Memorial has had uh, funding in this area uh, across the last uh, six years or more on a very large um, uh, si um, social sciences and humanities research council project. And there, there is scope um, for more projects in those areas from that and other funding sources. And of course that link, they link in and the, pro the program that we did have running, uh, Tradition and Transition, um, was linked into the indigenous uh, communities, the Inuit community of Nunatsiavut. So, um, so it, all I'm really saying is that I'm re reinforcing what others have said, but also indicating that there is there is tremendous scope for funding in this area too. Excellent, thank you, Neil. And I will just add the um, yeah the the point that there is. Um, uh, everything around training education in northern communities capacity building that's also integral as we talk about indigenous knowledge uh, in Canada. Um, another question I have for the group is about audience target audiences and how do we attract um, how do we attract more northerners to these conversations these webinars more youth more students. Um, David maybe I'll ask you that question if you have 
thoughts at all on how to broaden our reach. Um, and I think we had about 100 people that, um, that signed up for today. So I think we actually did a decent job at, at reaching out. And we just went broad. All of us went out through our networks. But um, yeah, David, if you have thoughts on that, and if others on the call have any thoughts on how to, how to uh, expand our audience and especially involve youth. Well, I'm really impressed just with the diversity of, of participation, and and I think um, we uh, we said there might be another four or five of these webinars, but in reality, I think there will be more. As as Emily indicated, the 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 um, webinar next week, the the wire, the women in renewable energy um, seminar, is not intended as a as a as part of this series, but there's lots of things. I, I imagine we're, we've only started to think about what other opportunities there are over the next year to, to uh, bring groups together. And maybe it won't be everyone for our, our thinking was maybe not everyone would be interested in all of the sessions, but I'd be very happy if we could have, it, th this has made me think that we should try to, to, to gather everybody together again, at least uh, once or twice over the next year with some, some more uh, general, uh, event and, and maybe a summary of, of what we've done uh, a year from now. But in terms of involving youth, I think um, we've had a few conversations about how, how this could, could work, um, perhaps by going through a, a, some more of the university networks, but also I think in, at least in, in, in Northern Canada, we could reach out and, and bring in some of the groups that, that are interested in STEM education and, and perhaps even some classrooms that might be interested in particular topics, uh, if we could uh, have a little a bit of lead time and, and make those connections. So I don't think we, we need to put any boundaries on the conversation, but if we do target those audiences, we might want to have content that, that would be of, of particular interest to them. Excellent. And I see we're getting lots of suggestions coming in on the, uh, on the chat line here about ways to involve uh, youth. So um, I hope we can kind of take a, a snapshot of that because that's going to be great. And I really want to, particularly schools, definitely. Thank you for that point, uh, Stephen, about schools and more schools and teachers. And then uh, Carol Ann, giving youth the opportunity to share, speak, learn. And I, I really would love to have all of our web webinars with students speaking and um, not just inviting to, but actually having a, a prominent role as one of our speakers. Um, I am sort of wary of the time, but we do have enough time for Embla to add on her point here. And then Andrew, I see you have your hand up. If there are other, other hands, please raise them now. Um, and then I'll make sure we have enough time for um, Ambas Ambassador Gudjonsson to say concluding remarks. So Embla, over to you. Well, I just wanted to add a little bit on the, on the reaching out to youth uh, uh, questions. I think it is enormously important. Um, I mean, this is, this is the generation that's going to be living in the region. Um, we're all kind of slowly on our way out a little bit, you know, and doing something really concrete like reaching out to the Arctic Youth Network. Um, I believe there's a network under the auspices, so the Arctic Council, with, which is the, uh, I'm going to probably going to get it wrong, Indigenous Youth, youth Network. Um, so trying to get them engaged by approaching them directly is, is probably a really important uh, part of, of reaching out. Um, another thing that I wanted to just mention, which is related to this, but not necessarily directly, it is it, this emphasis on innovation, I think is something that we need to pick apart a little bit more. Um, although, I, and I, th I agree with David, four or five webinars doesn't really seem enough, especially after having uh, topics that people have been sharing in the chat. I mean, there's like 30 different things going on. I think we could be doing this for the next couple of years and still not exhaust everything that we might be interested in. So we're going to have to pick and choose, but maybe we want to look at continuing this collaboration beyond the formal year of 75 years of celebrations. So sky is basically the limit. Um, but I, I also do wonder if, 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 if there's any way to reach out to the people that are here uh, today and helping us maybe disseminate information about the webinar so we can get a wider audience in, I think that would be enormously useful. I do also wonder if there's anyone from the business community on the, on the, in the meeting, because that's another audience that we're, we would be interested in, in hearing from. Um, uh, 
I think moving forward, we are going to have to figure out a better way to uh, create linkages between the academic. Um, I know this is easier said than done, but uh, we, we need to dip our toes in somewhere. So one from the business community on the call, it would be great to hear from you. Great. Thank you, Embla. Um, Andrew, did you still have a question or did your hand go down? I was just going to put my comments in the chat in the interest of that. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. That's great. And Leslie, I think there's a hand there as well. Just a, just a quick one, if that's all right. Yes, thank you. And I actually put it in the chat as well, but it was just, uh, this looks like a perfect group to help with trying to build connections for Indigenous and scientific collaborations to address the challenges in the Arctic for melting ice, which is what we work on. So, thank you. And I actually wrote it down on my piece of paper too, so I don't lose it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, Ambassador Gudjonsson, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, I think there's about three minutes left, and uh, certainly there's lots more to discuss. Please, if people want to use the chat to add on a few more uh, final points while we're while um, Plinar is concluding our comments, and we will look forward to seeing everyone at the next uh, the next talk. So, Ambassador, over to you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Ambassador, uh, and she is. Uh, it's been an amazing uh, conversation. And I think uh, David and Endla and, and you, Janet, for, for a great uh, moderation of, of this. Uh, I think we have, I don't know, between 40 and 50 uh, suggestions in the chat box on, on all kinds of topics and, and, uh, uh, and issues that we, we, should, we, should, we should touch on. Uh, so we, we have uh, quite a bit of work ahead of us. Um, just a few words on, on the 75 year anniversary. Um, uh, Iceland and Canada took up uh, diplomatic relations in 1947, and uh, it was actually our uh, ambassador in, in uh, DC that became the first um, Icelandic ambassador to Canada, and the first Canadian ambassador to Iceland was appointed in 1949 with residency in, in, in Oslo, Norway. Uh, we are, as, as has been mentioned, we are uh, programming uh, two of threads of, of discussions uh, in, in celebration of the anniversary in, in partnership with, with uh, uh, Polar Knowledge and, and, and Aquarity. Uh, the next four on the, on the science kind of in the Arctic uh, channel is, is uh, on January 18, we will be discussing gender equality in the, in the Arctic uh, based on, on, the, on the report that Embla uh, mentioned and, and the close collaboration uh, in that work between Iceland and Canada. Uh, and then we will be heading on to March, hopefully traditional indigenous local knowledge, uh, climate science and, and, and innovation and food security in, in September and November. But this we will uh, reconsider based on all the comments that we got on, on different topics that are of interest to, to the audience. And the other thread of, of, of uh, series that kind of talks that we've been discussing is then more based on Canada Iceland relations and uh, there we are looking at the first event in February on, on potentially oceans, uh, the blue economy and innovation, and the potential work that, that we can do uh, there between Iceland and, and, and Canada, uh, both on research, but also uh, on, on the trade side. Uh, and then we will be looking at a, um, in May, possibly a, a fireside chat with, with, uh, uh, on, with, with some, potentially ministers, uh, then in October, Canadian Icelandic literature, and um, in December, uh, we'll possibly be going more into the, the, the Icelandic settlement in, in, in Canada um, and, and the, 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 the history be, between, between the countries uh, since then. So um, I thank you all uh, again for, for attending. Uh, this has been, been a, a fantastic start, I think. And, and thank you, Janet, for, for moderating, and David and, and Embla for uh, your input, and everyone else for your input into this. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and stay tuned for future webinars on a whole range of series, and uh, do let us know if you think of other things and topics that you want to share with us. Thanks. Thank you.